When it comes to getting around, the animal kingdom has certainly developed a vast array of solutions. But from claws and hooves to sticky pads and suction cups, it's clear that feet are built for a lot more than just locomotion. And it isn't just the exotic animal genre with imaginative uses for their appendages, as even the familiar feet of mammals are surprisingly diverse, each adapted to their unique way of life. Three primary foot types exist in terrestrial mammals. Plantigrade is when the surface of the whole foot touches the ground during locomotion. Digitigrade only allows for the toes to touch the ground, leaving the ankles and wrists elevated. And Ungulagrade is when only a hoof, aka the nail of one or two digits, contacts the ground. A specialization of both running animals and the most nimble of climbers. Of course, given the fluidity of nature, it should come as no surprise that there are those that readily swap between these forms, as well as those that exist permanently between them. Take the Graviportal species, for example. Much like the pedestal of a column, these lumbering behemoths have converged on specializations to support their massive size, deploying their digits in a circle around the axis of their limbs for maximum support, whilst walking on fat pads which shift their weight onto their toes, resulting in their semi-plantigrade classification. Naturally, there are others with equally specialized extremities. The back limbs of the macropods, lagomorphs, and certain lineages of rodents are saltatorial. Meaning, although they're primarily plantigrade when walking or resting, they can explosively flee digitigradally should the need arise. The dorsigrades, or knuckle walkers, are also primarily plantigrade, but this diverse mix of species converged on their unique walking style to safeguard the secondary functions of their pods, be it the protection of their fingers, which are essential for climbing, grasping, and tool use, to keeping their delicate webbing safe, crucial for a semi-aquatic lifestyle, or even the preservation of their large claws, which are used to break into insect nests. While the latter of these species use their claws as a means to acquire food, another group use their powerful clawed limbs as paddles for life underground. The fossorial mammals have a lot of things in common, especially when it comes to their feet. As, since swiftness or agility are less important than the strength to dig, many within this group have been graced with short stout limbs, with broader, longer clawed forelimbs designed to loosen the substrate from the front for the hind feet to disperse to the back. While many of the taxa we've covered so far live on or below the ground, the scansorial mammals have evolved feet designed to help them navigate life in the trees, often combining sharp claws, flexible digits, highly mobile ankle joints, and or elongated limbs to help them cross gaps, reach resources, and test the firmness of the support ahead. When it comes to our planet's aquatic mammals, you'd be forgiven for not thinking about their diversity of feet at first glance. But millions of years ago, these two sported similar clogs. The cetaceans are the most species rich of the marine mammals, and currently hold the title for the largest species the Earth has ever seen. But they once looked like this. Meet the goat-sized Pachycetus, an even-toed ungulate, whose closest living non-cetacean relatives are the hippos. Although they evolved around the same time, the Cyrenians, or sea cows, are truly unique, as they're the only herbivorous mammals to ever become completely aquatic. Their progenitor was the Pezosiren, or walking manatee, and their closest living non-Cyrenian relatives are the elephants. Finally, though aquatic, the pinnipeds still spend significant amounts of time on land and therefore have retained some of the load-bearing functionality in their flippers, allowing them to support their weight and or move across rocky shores, sandy beaches, or ice, whilst maintaining their proficiency in the water. This balance of aquatic and terrestrial adaptations shows how mammals like otters and yapox could follow a similar evolutionary path, gradually becoming more specialized for aquatic life whilst maintaining some land mobility. When it comes to the rest of the animal kingdom, the adaptations get pretty crazy. When we think of reptilian foot adaptations, the first thing that comes to mind is often their ability to climb almost all surfaces. For some, the answer is as simple as employing powerful clawed feet with robust digits, but there are others that take things a fair bit further. For example, gecko feet have hundreds of tiny hairs called setae. The setae then split into even smaller bristles called spatulae, and these microscopic bristles create weak molecular attractions with surfaces. Known as van der Waals forces, 
branches. These are what allow geckos to climb vertical structures and hang from walls and ceilings. Anoles, like geckos, make use of van der Waals forces to adhere to sheer surfaces. But they do things a little differently. This group of lizards have specialized toe pads with tiny structures called lamellae, which, when combined with friction and sharp claws, allow them to grip to vertical surfaces. Some reptile feet are so special, they can even perform miracles. Basilisks and sail fins are best known for their defense strategy. When threatened, they drop from trees into the water, where they sprint upright at speeds of roughly 5 feet per second across the surface. To accomplish this, they have long toes on their rear feet, with skin flaps that unfurl to increase surface area. As they rapidly slap their splayed feet against the water, tiny air pockets are created that keep them afloat. They can run like this for over 15 feet, swapping to swimming when gravity finally takes its toll. Although sand isn't nearly as fluid as water, it can still be tricky to navigate this medium. That being said, many desert-dwelling lizards have fringes of scales along the sides of their toes. The fringes act like snowshoes, spreading out the lizard's weight to prevent sinking as they travel across the loose shifting sands. The feet of terrestrial turtles couldn't be more different. Described as elephantine, these stumpy column-like clogs support their heavy bodies, allowing them to move across several terrains and dig burrows for shelter, albeit slowly. Even snakes, universally thought of as legless, still have feet sort of. You see, some pythons and boas have vestigial limbs called spurs near their cloaca, and in some species, males use these small claw-like structures during mating to stimulate the females. When it comes to birds, many of them share the same structure, three toes that point forward and one toe that points backwards. Known as anisodactyly, this allows them to wrap their feet around branches when it's time to perch, but some take it further by employing a zygodactylous structural pattern which gives them the ability to easily cling to vertical surfaces. And in parrots, it provides dexterity when handling food and objects. Heterodactyly, seen only in the trogons, is similar to zygodactyly, but the configuration of toes is different. As for the other four toe configurations, syndactyly, a characteristic of the caraciforms, is similar to anisodactyly, except two to three toes are fused together, almost to their claws. And pamprodactyly, seen in swifts and mouse birds, is an arrangement in which all four toes point forward, with the outer toes often being reversible. Though most birds are four-toed, some are tridactyl, only possessing the three forward-facing toes, and only one species is didactyl. The cursorial feet of ostriches are designed for fast, efficient running, their reduced number of digits helping to minimize resistance and maximize speed. Similar to adaptations seen in running mammals. Lastly, when it comes to the webbed species, even these show a breadth of variation. Palmate is the typical webbed foot arrangement seen in ducks, geese, and swans. Here, the front three toes are fully webbed, but the hallux is free of the webbing. In the toti palmates, all four toes are fully webbed. A specialization seen in the fish chasers like pelicans, cormorants, and boobies, which all rely on the extra paddle propulsion to capture their prey. The toes of the semi-palmates are only partially webbed, which helps birds like plovers and sandpipers move efficiently in muddy environments. Finally, in lobate feet, the toes have lobes of skin that expand and contract as the bird swims. Seen in the grebes and the coots, the lobes act like collapsible flippers, allowing the birds to swim effectively, whilst making it easier to move on land compared to having fully webbed feet. As for the amphibians, their feet are special as they have to accommodate two different modes of life. For rock-dwelling salamanders, this means employing broad, flattened feet with thick, fleshy, clawless toes, an adaptation that allows them to hold onto slippery substrates in strong currents, preventing them from being swept away. Climbing salamanders differ slightly in that they possess elongated, square-tipped toes, which aid in their ascent. Across both groups of species, several also have plate-like webbing, which adhere to smooth surfaces by suction, perfect for both their aquatic and moist terrestrial lifestyles. Though these animals may superficially look like small lizards, they couldn't be more different. For one, salamanders put lizard regeneration to shame. Not only can they regrow lost toes or even feet, but this ability extends to entire limbs, vital organs such as the heart, parts of their spinal cords, and even entire jaws, all without leaving a scar. 
For the frogs, which make up close to 90% of the known amphibian class, many rely on fully webbed feet, which function like paddles. Increasing surface area for propulsion, ensuring they can quickly escape from predators or hunt prey underwater. This webbing varies greatly between species, and some have taken advantage of their ability to fly through the water by evolving to glide through the air. That being said, there are also those that have lost their webbing entirely, instead favoring feet that permit a more arboreal lifestyle. For example, some tree frogs have adhesive mucus-secreting pads on their toes, which they use to stick to smooth vertical surfaces like leaves and branches. Glass frogs do something similar, but rather than sticking, they suck. These amphibians possess suction cup-like toe pads with microscopic ridges that allow them to cling to slick surfaces. Handy, as maintaining a grip can be quite challenging due to their moist habitats. And for those that aren't so fortunate as to have a steady supply of moisture, digging is the next best option. The hind feet of the spadefoot toads have hardened keratinous spade-like structures, which they use for burrowing into soft soil to escape the heat, cold, or drought, and to estivate during dry periods. While fish don't often come to mind when talking about feet, here too there are examples of species that have evolved structures to help them get around. The most well-known of these fishes are undoubtedly the mudskippers, which possess prominent jointed pectoral fins which function much like limbs, allowing them to crawl, skip, and leap from place to place, and even to climb low-hanging tree branches and scrubs. These amphibious gobids are able to breathe using water trapped in their gill chambers, as well as through oxygen absorption via the lining of their mouths and throats, thus facilitating their ability to spend up to three quarters of their lives on land. As mentioned, there are other fish species that also make a habit of walking, using a combination of modified pectoral and or pelvic fins to scurry across land, or to crawl across the ocean floor. These adaptations blur the line between swimming and walking, showcasing the incredible versatility of fish in different environments. And finally, when it comes to arthropods, bloody hell, there are a fair few foot types to go through, as this clade likely has more foot variety than the rest of the animal phyla combined. Combined. Unsurprising, as with a species count of up to 10 million, the arthropods make up up to 80% of all known animal species, and their feet are just as diverse. From the adorable paws of spiders, which are actually dense pads of hair located near the claws, known as claw tufts or scopulae, a characteristic of several species that plays a major role in attachment during locomotion, to the soft cushion-like pulvilli of flies and ticks that function as an adhesive system, their sticking power coming mainly from the adhesive fluids they secrete onto surfaces, and chele or pincers, a convergent foot found in the crustaceans and arachnids, used to assist in feeding, defense, or even courtship, to those that combine heavily scaled or hairy feet with surface tension, allowing them to land on or travel across water. Even forcipules, the modified front legs of centipedes that are used to envenomate prey. This is the only known example of front legs acting as venom injectors. Needless to say, the feet of arthropods are a testament to nature's creativity, each one connected to its environment and perfectly adapted to every niche and habitat. Of course, this video just scratches the surface when it comes to our planet's bevy of tootsie so if you enjoyed this deep dive into the feet of the animal kingdom and would like to see more videos like it, then do me a favor and like, comment, and subscribe to join our tribe. And now you know.